Good morning. Um, I I follow the NRL. I love rugby league, and I don't follow the Panthers or the or the Storm. So I don't really care who wins in that respect. But um, as my T-shirt says, as long as we know in the end, God wins. So that's the main thing. Um, okay. So, um, so as we've made our way through Joshua so far, we've we've seen. We've seen a few things. We've seen a few battles. Um, some, most have been won, but we've seen one that was lost. Um, we went ahead of a, uh, a spy story a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, we've seen God using the Israelites um, as well as His own power in different cases um, in these battles. Well, today's story is a little bit different. In Joshua chapter nine, we have not a battle, but a deception, an oath that's given, and then an act of justice. I want to start this morning just by telling a short story um, of something that happened to me just last week. See, I had an interview at, at work to apply for a, a new position, um, a, a supervisor's role. The interview was scheduled um, for the end of my normal shift. Now, just before I went into the interview, I had an important conversation with, with one of the people who was going to be um, actually running that, in, that interview. I inquired of him what exactly was going to happen um, during the interview, what kinds of questions I was going to be asked, who else would be there, and how I should answer or respond to each question. He told me all the things I needed to know uh, before going in. You see, I asked the person who was <clears throat> in control of the interview for advice, for wisdom. And it helped me get through the interview. It went well. It was successful. <clears throat> You can ask me later about whether I got the job or not. I'll let you know. Now to today's passage in Joshua 9. But just before we start looking at that, um, I'll just pray for us. Father God, <clears throat> as we look at this morning at Joshua chapter 9, we pray that you would speak clearly to us all that you would impress upon us what you would have us learn from you. Help me to speak clearly and truthfully from your word, that we all might be encouraged <clears throat> and challenged by you. Amen. Now, as I was reading and considering this passage over the last couple of weeks, there are seven words that kept speaking to me in a powerful way. And there in verse 14. Israel did not inquire of the Lord. Israel did not inquire of the Lord. These are the key words, the key verse, the main point of today's sermon. That's the punchline. That's it. That's right. I've just stolen my own thunder. Well... It's actually God's thunder. I've given you the ending at the beginning. But the question is, why is that the main point? Well, let's have a look. In verses 3 to 15 of the, of the chapter, we read of how the people of Gibeon come to Joshua and the Israelites because they want to make a treaty. In verse 3, we read that the Gibeonites had heard, they'd heard what Joshua had done in Jericho and Ai. They knew about Israel's successful battles and something of Israel's God's power. In verse 24, it also says, they knew of God's plan to wipe out all the inhabitants of the land which God had promised to Israel. This is why the Gibeonites sought, sought to have a, a peace treaty with Israel, 
They simply didn't, didn't want to be wiped out by Israel and their powerful God. Now, the Gibeon people came up with, with a plan, a pretty clever plan, I think, in, in a lot of ways, to try to trick Joshua and, and the leaders um, into thinking that they were from a faraway land and not from Canaan. Uh, in verse 4 it says, They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and mouldy. See, they made it look like they'd travelled a great distance to get where Joshua and Israel were camped at Gilgal. All this evidence was shown to Josh, that was shown to Joshua was pretty convincing and looked pretty impressive to back up their story. Obviously so much so that Joshua and the other leaders bought it, book, line and sinker. Now this reminds me of the old Colgate TV ad. You know the one with, Miss, with Mrs Marsh where she has the chalk dipped in the, in the glass of, of blue or purple dye. She then pulls out the chalk, breaks it in half, revealing that the, the dye had actually soaked into the chalk. Do you remember it? I'm sure you all do. We can all clearly see, we can, we, I'm sure we can picture it in our heads, we can clearly see, it's obvious, it's visually convincing. Of course, the idea is that this demonstration by, by Mrs. Marsh is meant to prove that the Colgate toothpaste actually soaks into or penetrates our teeth in the same way. Very visual, not really very scientific. I mean, it convinced me as a kid, and probably a long way as an adult as well, <laughs> did it convince you? Now, I think Joshua was, was convinced the same way by the evidence which the Gibeonites had shown. In verse 12, the Gibeonites, they explain how the bread was freshly break, baked when they left. But because of the long journey, it was now dry, mouldy and in, in, inedible. The wineskins, they say in verse 13, were we're new and freshly filled, but are now cracked. Their clothes and sandals were now worn out from travelling so far. That then brings us to verse 14, where we read, The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. There they are, there's the words, there's seven words. They did not inquire of the Lord. I almost think that they could have avoided, avoided the future problem that we'll, we'll talk about in a little while. Um, if only they did inquire of the Lord. The same way that I had inquired of the person that was in charge of my interview for help. But instead of inquiring of the Lord, what does happen in verse 15? Well, we read that Joshua makes a treaty of peace with the Gibeonites and didn't destroy the people, but let them live. The treaty was also sealed by an oath, an oath which was made under God, under Yahweh, and as such could not be taken back or reneged upon. So Israel now could not seemingly take the whole land which God had promised to them. We will see how God does sort this problem out a bit later on. So Joshua and the leaders, they did do good investigation um, from an earthly point of view, with all the evidence they had, but they didn't pray. They didn't ask God for his wisdom. How often do we do that? We see a certain situation from a worldly point of view. It all looks good. Like it will, it will all work out the way we want. 
how do we see it, how do we foresee it? We've thought through the logic and the practicality of it all. It all seems good. But we don't pray. We leave God out of it altogether. I admit I do this all the time. Especially when things are going well and all seems good. But then things don't quite end up how you thought they would. And you realise I didn't inquire of the Lord. No wonder it didn't go as planned. In the book of James in the New Testament, in chapter 1, verse 5, we read that if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. We should always inquire of the Lord. Moving on to the next section of the passage, um, we see from verse 16 that after three days, Joshua and the Israelites, they realised they'd been duped, that the Gibeonites had deceived them. The Gibeonites were not from a far, far away land at all. They were neighbours. The Israelites were livid. They wanted blood. They wanted to destroy Gibeon. But Joshua and the leaders reminded them of the oath that was made. I suspect that many of the Israelites questioned why that oath, the treaty, had to be honoured, as it was, it was made under false pretenses after all. The leaders simply stated to them that we have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. You see, it, it was irrelevant how the, how the oath was made. It was irrelevant how the oath was made. The important thing was that the oath was made in God's name. And for that reason, it was to be honoured. <clears throat> now, ultimately, the reason that they were tricked into the oath was not because of the dubious evidence. It was because they had not called upon their God upon Yahweh for wisdom. The Gibeonites were not to be destroyed. Can you see the dilemma that's going on here? Gibeon was situated in the, in the, in the land promised to Israel, but the people of Gibeon could not be conquered. They could not be destroyed or driven out. Have Joshua and the Israelites now wrecked God, God's plan? How could God fulfill his promise to Israel? His promise to Abraham back in Genesis 12, all those years ago. We will see how God sorts out this apparent mess. We will see that maybe, just maybe, this was in God's plan all along. Sometimes we, we do the same as Joshua and, and Israelites. We fail to ask God for wisdom and then end up in a situation where we, we cannot see a way out of. God will not neglect or abandon us, even in our failing to trust him. But we need to acknowledge our error and call upon him. Ask for wisdom. And he will act in love not foregoing his own character, his justice and mercy. Gibeon would not be destroyed. Gibeon would not be destroyed. This is a form of God's mercy, can you see? They would, however, be cursed. In verse 23, Joshua tells them, you are now under a curse. You will never be released from service as woodcutters, and water carriers for the house of my God. <clears throat> the Gibeonites were to be in servitude to Israel, specifically to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord, as it says in verse 27. 
You see, they receive judgment or justice in the form of a curse to be servants. But actually receive mercy at the same time by being given a special role in the worship of God. You see, as woodcutters and water carriers, they would perform crucial roles in the worship of God and, and the, the sacrificial system that, that Israel would, would observe. This role was actually continued well into the future history of Israel, as stated in verse 27, where it says, and that is what they are to this day. Even 400 years later, in the time of King David, where he puts the tabernacle, the, the place where God dwells, in Gibeon, reaffirming the importance of the place and the people of Gibeon. Do you think that that was in God's plan all along for the Gibeonites to, be, to have that special role in God's people? I think it was. God used Joshua's lack of trust, his failure to seek God's wisdom, to bring about his plan. Yes, Joshua and Israel did do the right thing eventually by keeping the oath that they had made um, to Gibeon. But I think it's clear that God would have shown mercy to the Gibeonites despite Joshua's failings. After all, we read in Romans chapter 8, in verse 28, that God works in all things for the good of those who love him, even when we stuff it up. Now, to bring all this information together, what should we take away from this story? I want to ask you, who do you think you are most like in today's passage? Are you, are you like the Gibeonites? Or are you more like Joshua? The Gibeonites came to God initially really out of fear. They had an impure motive for wanting to be united with the Israelites. They, they'd heard of the power of God, the mighty power of God, and they didn't want to be destroyed as the cities of Jericho and Ai were. I mean, I can understand why. I think actually we, we, all, we all can relate to the Gibeonites before, before becoming Christians. And what I mean is this. Ask yourself, what, what prompted me to come to God in the first place? Why did I seek God out? Maybe it was fear, like the Gibeonites. Fear of going to hell for eternity. Maybe it was the hope of having a better, easier life. Surely God could help me with that. Maybe it was a search for peace, whatever that means. You may have been going through a really hard time, perhaps health-wise or, or losing somebody close to you. While any, of the, any or all of these reasons might seem legitimate, the only pure motive to seek God, to come to him, is because he is God, simply because he's God. He's the loving creator. He's Lord of all. But despite our motives, despite our imperfect motives, God always accepts us. He accepts us as we are, with all our imperfections and sin. Of course, that's just the beginning of the journey for us as Christians. God not only wants us to come to him, but desires us to accept Jesus as our saviour, and continue to follow him as God and as Lord. He will be working in us by his spirit to bring that to fulfilment. 
we are to follow and serve God and his people, the church, with whatever gifts he has given us. In the same way God accepted the Gibeonites into his people to be a part of his chosen people, with a special, pl- a special part to play in the worship of God himself, he will accept us into his family to be part of his chosen people with a unique place in his church. Or do you relate to Joshua, <clears throat> who didn't inquire of the Lord? Do you fail to ask God to be involved in all aspects of your life? Do you rely on your own apparent earthly logic and wisdom? I know I do. I wasn't sure if I was going to share this um, this morning, but, but I will. So with that job interview that I had, even though I did inquire of the person that was going to run the interview, I didn't inquire of the Lord and I didn't get the job. I didn't get the position. But when you rely on your own earthly logic and wisdom, do things go awry when you do this? Do you realise or remember when it's too late to ask God for wisdom. You know, it's never too late to come to God to ask for wisdom. The same way that Joshua and the Israelites eventually did the right thing and kept their oath, which they had made before God, we too can choose to ask God for his wisdom and intervention at any time. God will respond any time we ask. Even when we think we're so far down a path, we think we can never go back. Yes, God loves us that much. So let me ask, are you going to inquire of the Lord? I just want to, just want to finish by reading... Uh, a paragraph from this book, this book that I got from from Di, who got from Jeanette, and I think I've got to give back to Dave. <laughs> it's all about um, the book of Joshua, and I'm just going to read the last chap, the last paragraph of the chapter that's on talking about Joshua chapter nine. It's called, sorry, the book's called. Joshua and the Flow of Biblical History, and it's by Francis A. Schaeffer. And he, he writes, If the Gibeonites could rely on an oath, the Israelites had... Sorry. If the Gibeonites could rely on an oath, the Israelites made in the adverse circumstance of the Gibeon's, Gibeonites' deception, when the Israelites did not even ask God's counsel, how much more confident can we be in God's oath to us? May we rely upon it. May we cast ourselves upon Christ and be those of a completely quiet heart. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we can come to you at any time that you indeed want us to come to you. Thank you that you accept us with all of our faults. Thank you for making us part of your chosen people. Help us always to inquire of you. Amen.